Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, and Chodesh Tov. I'm going to share my source sheet in a minute. But today's topic is going to be, there's our source sheet. It's right here. Here we go. Okay, the transition from the Boa de Chokmah in light of the prophecies of Zechariah. Um, I want to give a couple introductory points, and then we'll get to work. Um, there's a general question, what's the purpose of prophecy? Or whether it's predicting history or shaping history. It's a well-known um, argument, but in regular jargon, people think someone's a prophet, he has the ability to predict what's going to happen in the future. And when you study, second, I get background noise. Give me a second, I'll mute everybody. I don't know if I mute everybody, I won't hear you guys. Um, okay, we're good. I'll start again. Okay. Our standard understanding is that when someone calls he's a prophet, it means he can predict events. In Chumash, the job of the prophet is not to predict the future, it's to shape the future. And a Navi is God's spokesperson. Um, now, a, a Navi is not only judged by his um, ability to predict the future. If, if you're going to judge a Navi, his purpose, and whether he's successful or not, if he has the ability to shape the future. Now, everyone knows that the books of the of Nevoah, the Tanakh, closes in the beginning of the Second Temple period. The final Navim, or Haggai, Zechari, and Malachi, they're the beginning of the Second Temple period. I'm sure we're familiar during the Second Period after Ezra and Nehemiah. There's no more Nevoah. And the question comes up, why did Nevoah stop? So there's a rabbinic statement, we'll see the Gemara very soon, we'll begin, that um, at a certain point, Nevoah stopped and Chochmah took over. It was called Chacham Adif B'Navi. Um, a, a wise Torah scholar, um, sort of better or his preference over over a prophet. But I want to try to explain today what was the reason for that and what's the underlying message by that transition. What's called from the Vada Chokma. So we're going to get to work, and I'll share my source sheet. Here we go. I'm going to begin with um, the famous Talmudic source in Mesechet Baba Batra, Rafid Bet, Amr Rav Dimi Dimi Chayva. Okay. From the time the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, the Nevoah went from the prophets and was given to the wise men. Now, the question is, which Beit HaMikdash is it talking about? What would people say? Is this talking about the first Beis HaMikdash being destroyed or the second? Any suggestions? Okay. First. Okay. It's... If it's the first, then, but there's still Nevi'im in the beginning of the second. On the other hand, the last several hundred years of the second temple period, there's no Nevoah. And there was no Nevoah before it was destroyed. So it makes more sense to probably referring to the first. Okay? Then it asks the question, Atu chacham lav And I want, I want to use the first. You'll see what, why I'm saying that in a minute. Um, but isn't a chacham um, like a Nevi? So he says, no. Af even though it was taken away from Nevi'im, Hachamim still have the ability to, to maybe understand or shape the future. We'll see in a minute. And then Ramein Merkos, a Pasek, sort of out of context in Tehilim, the Nevi Dva Chochmah, I'll, um, I'll, I'm trying to support that idea from there. Now, what I want to do today in the share is try to suggest a deeper meaning to this rabbinic understanding, more Midrashic understanding, of why we went from Nevoah to Chochmah and why sort of, not just at the end of the first temple period, but at the very beginning of the second temple period. And we'll see it's happening um, right before the second temple was being built. Um, our main source would be Zechariah chapter 7 and 8, which hopefully should be, most of you are familiar with. I just want to begin with the first line, and we'll talk about the history. This Nebuah takes place, We're talking about the Persian time period the beginning of the second temple period under Shiva Tzion, I'm sure you're familiar, it's the Persian king Cyrus who allowed the Jews to return, but he was the first Persian king. The temple didn't get off the ground during his reign. Only during the reign of Daryavesh did they begin construction of the temple that's going to be completed. So there's the Persian king Cyrus, followed by Persian king Darius, who's in between. That's a different complicated topic we're not going to go into. Okay. Now, um, there's a question that was sent to Zechariah in the ninth month, in Kislev, okay? And a group of people, a delegation from Babylonia, um, these all seem to be Babylonian names, Jewish people from Babylonia, a group of people, I think a delegation, 
came, listen carefully, lechalotit pnei Hashem. Means to turn to God in prayer or to ask a question, that they're an inquiry, they want to know what God wants about, what God's understanding is of a certain question. Lemor lakonim, asher lebeit Hashem, to ask a question to the priests who are God's house, and to the Nevim, saying, do we continue crying in the fifth month? Okay. Basically, if we want to translate it into a more uh, popular jargon, they ask the question, do we continue fasting on Tisha B'Av? Now, what's the logic behind it? We'll stop this here for a minute. The logic behind it is simple. The custom began, as we'll see, after the first temple was destroyed, to fast on the day that commemorated its destruction. So there was a fast day in the, in the fifth month, in the month of Av, B'chorosh HaChamishi, there was a custom to fast. Was it a custom to fast on the ninth of Av, the tenth of Av, the seventh or eighth? You can argue. But there was a custom to fast in the month of Av to remember the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. And we'll say later on there were actually four fast days um, in historical order. On the tenth of Tevet, the day the city was put under siege, um, a year and a half before it was destroyed. We're talking about the dates of the end of the first temple period. Um, then when the walls were breached in, this, um, in Tammuz, um, several weeks before it was destroyed, a fast in the month of Av, when it was destroyed, and a fast in the month of Tishrei, what we call Tzum Gedaya. Um, after that was assassination, there was hope maybe a small group would remain. That was called the Sherita Plita, the last remnant was still in Judea. They were exiled as well, or they, they weren't exiled, they actually ran away to Egypt, and there was no longer Jewish presence in Israel. But those four events are called the four fast days, which I'm sure you're familiar with. We're going to focus on the Nevoah and the fourth year of Dayavesh. I'm just going to go quickly over um, the key events. I'll just show you in the book of, um, let me share my screen, from the book of Ezra real fast. Actually, if I take a look at, I'll look at this one over here. If you look at the different prophets, um, the Nevim, you just see the list over here of the Nevim. Um, the last of the Nevim, Chagai and Zechariah Malachi, our second temple period, early second temple, all the other ones are first temple period. If I look at the Ketuvim, I'm not sure the dates of many of them, but again, the final books are Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, which is the beginning of the second temple period as well. So we're talking about the beginning of the second temple period. If I go to the book of Ezra, in the first year of Koresh, the king of Paras, that's when Koresh gives his famous declaration about allowing the Jews to return to build the Beit HaMikdash. If you know your book of Ezra, in chapter 4, the building doesn't get off the ground. The uh, enemies of Yehuda, the local population, gives the people returning to try to build the Mikdash a hard time. And the local population uh, weakened the hands of the people of Yehuda and scaring them from building. And here's the famous historical line. They hired lobbyists um, to, to the Persian authorities to stop this idea of building the temple from the time of Koresh until the reign of Daryavesh meaning there's a building freeze from Koresh to Dayavesh. During Dayavesh, we get the temple off the ground. And we'll see in chapter 6 of the book of Ezra, this is already in Aramaic, we get the final date. What are we told? And um, here, the elders of Jew Jews built and prospered with the help of Haggai Zcharia and, uh, and, and different kings. And the house was finished, being built on the third day of the month of Adar, which was year six of King Dayavesh, meaning the second temple's construction is completed in the sixth year of Dayavesh. If you remember from the book of Haggai, um, it began, I'll just go quickly to the book of Haggai. They break ground on, in the second year, in the second year of Dayavesh, famous line in chapter two, verse 10, on the 24th day of Kislev, Erev Hanukkah, and the taking of Dayavesh, um, this was the day that they began construction of, of the second temple, putting stone on top of stone when they broke down on the second temple. He told the people, pay attention to this day. And he says again, uh, pay attention to this day, the day, the 24th of Kislev, the day that they began uh, constructing the second temple, Behechal. And he gives a famous Nevo, hoping to return to prosperity and to sovereignty. So again, if I want to sort of summarize the key, the key years we're going to talk about, let me share my other file um, just quickly. Um, year one in Koresh begins what's called Shibat Siyom. 
the return of the exile. Then there's the gap. Who's in the gap? It could be Achashverosh, it might be Cambyses, different topic. In year two of Daryavesh, about 18 years later, yeah, it's described in the book of Ezra, they began construction of the temple. On year six, we saw the temple was being finished. Okay? Then there's another gap in the book of Ezra. Um, then we jump to the year of seven of our Tachshasta, and then year 20 and 32 and 34 of our Tachshasta. That's Ezra and Nehemiah. But remember, Ezra and Nehemiah are not Nevim in the Ketuvim, and they don't give prophecies. Then God doesn't speak to them. They might speak on behalf of God. They lead the people, but in, they're in Ketuvim and not in Nevim. I'm pointing this out <laughs> because the last dated Nebuah we have in Tanakh, there might have been Nevim later. That we, we can't prove for sure. But the last time there's a dated Nebuah in Tanakh is the fourth year of Dayavish. That's my key point. It means between year two of Dayavish and year six of Dayavish, between the breaking ground on the temple and its completion, there's an event. Chapter seven of Zechariah yeah, is in year four of Dayavish. It's Halfway through the construction of the second temple, it's the last dated nevoah in Tanakh. Hope that's clear. The last time we have a nevoah with a date, and that's the day that the second temple isn't built. It's it started. It's not finished yet. And therefore, if I want to be technical, there is no dated nevoah once the second temple is built. Now I want to take this nevoah of year four of Dayavesh and use it as a springboard to understand why we go from nevoah to chokmah. So let's get to work. Okay. Now, what was the question they asked? Um, they asked the question, do we continue fasting in the fifth month? And I'll, I'll get to the English Hebrew version in a minute. But I just want to do the God's first answer. In Pasuk Dalet, Vaidvar Hashem Svotei God told Zechariah the Navi, tell the people who inquired about fasting on Tisha B'av, go tell the people, and more call Amars, tell the people who are asking this question, and the Kohanim, who their question is being sent to, I call this a Jewish answer. God answers the question with his own question. Because you might have been fasting on these different fast days. God's saying, have I been fasting? When you eat and drink, <coughs> you're the ones eating and drinking, and not me. It, in a sort of sarcastic way, what is God saying, or through the Navi? Saying, I didn't ask you to eat, I don't ask you to fast. Which I like to sort of paraphrase. God is saying, don't ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Durabana is only the Oraita. Meaning, there's no law in Chumash, or no law by Navim, that you have to fast on the four fast days to commemorate Jerusalem. That was a rabbinic decision. The people decided, the people took upon themselves the custom of fasting. And when they asked God, should we continue fasting? On Tisha B'Av or not, God's answer is, don't ask me, ask yourselves. That's not a question for me. You decided to fast, it's up to you. Now, there's two ways to understand the question. Are they asking, are they sure now that the temple is being finished? And they're asking, once a temple is constructed, is there any reason to fast anymore? Or are they asking, is this really happening? Meaning, they've been... <coughs> excuse me. Um, they've been... Disappointed before, because it, some 20 years earlier, they started working on the temple and it stopped. The temple was destroyed 50, 60 years earlier. Um, and they've been constantly been disappointed in all their attempts to rebuild it. And now, are they asking, are we going to be disappointed again and it's not going to get off the ground? Or is this really the final one? Because they could be asking a question, a technical question. Is this really happening? Is redemption really going to be complete? Or are they asking, assuming it's complete, do we continue fasting? Now, but God takes this opportunity, this question, to say what you should have been asking. I'll give a little story that used to happen all the time. Um, in Yeshiva, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, all of us, used to have what's called a tish with the students. So someone would ask a question, and usually the questions would be a little off topic or something. And he would say, here's what you should be asking. Now, when someone would ask a question, and he would take the question and sort of turn it around and say, if you're going to ask a question, that's it. this should be the topic of the question and not that. Meaning, God's saying, once you're asking a question, don't ask me about fasting, but here's what you should be asking me. In other words, if the underlying question is, is the temple going to be off the ground? Will it really work? Is the second temple really going to happen? Here's what you should be asking. And now we're going to read God's answer 
which is the key to the share. I'll have it highlighted and then we'll do it in English and Hebrew. Okay. So, he said, if, you're, if you want to know what God wants you to do, if you want to fast, that's your problem. If you're asking the Navi, what does God want from you? It's really simple. All that you need to do are the same things that the early Navi, the Navi Mishonim, that we call, we call them Navi Machronim. What the Navi are called Navi Mishonim, we call Navi Machronim. We'll prove this in a minute. But he says, the earlier prophets, Yirmiyahu, Yeshayahu, Yechezkel, the prophets who warned you about the possibility of Thirst Temple being destroyed, who tried to prevent it, they warned you what might happen, that the destruction might happen if you don't fix your ways. So if you want to know what you should be asking, if you want this temple to work, you should be asking, what do we need to do from our point of view, from our side, what do we need to do to make sure that this temple gets off the ground and redemption is complete? And if you want to know what to do, and here's my key point. You don't need to ask me. Just open up the books of the earlier prophets. Because if you want to know if the temple is going to be completed or this temple is going to last, then ask yourself, what was the reason why the first one was destroyed? How do you know why the first one was destroyed? Open up the prophecies of Yishayahu, Yirmiyahu, also basically what we call Nevi Machronim. Again, what he calls here Nevi Mishonim. Study them carefully. Use wisdom, use chokmah to study them and understand what was the reason why the first temple was destroyed. And if you want to know what will be with the second temple, simply don't make the same mistakes that caused the first temple to be destroyed. Now, what I want to use this as a springboard to make my key point is that what's the last dated nevoah of Panach telling you? That you don't need new nevi'im, just read the ones that we have already. The that nevoah is over. If there was a navi, he wouldn't say fundamentally, he wouldn't say anything different than what the earlier Nevi'im said. And therefore, there's enough Nevo'ah from the first temple period, especially the, the rebuke Nevo'ah, where the Nevi'im explained why God was so upset and why he sent Amisar into exile and why the first temple was destroyed. If I study those Nevi'im carefully, I'll have a very good idea, if I study them and apply them to any future time period, I'll have a pretty good idea of what God wants from me. And therefore, I don't need Nevo'ah anymore. I need Chochmah. I need the wisdom to take the earlier Nevo'ah and apply them in new situations. Right. Now I want to show you this in, in Zechariah's Nebua. After this opening line, Zechariah now is going to get more detailed in case people don't know why the first temple was destroyed. He's going to quote what we'll see from Yirmiyahu and from Yishayel. God tells Zechariah to tell the people the following. This is the word of God. Here's what you need to do. Mishpat okay? right? Judge people with truth. Right? And Rahmin Asu Basically, good old Chesed Sabiko Mishpat that all the Navim of uh, what we call Navim Akronim, what they all talked about. Right? And have kindness and have mercy, one to each other, and have justice. And at the same time, take care of the widow, the Amana, Yatom, and Gervani, the poor, the stranger, the orphan, the widow. Don't abuse them, don't exploit them, don't take advantage of them, even though it's easy to. And don't think evil about your fellow man. Now, don't think, what's he up to? What's that one up to? Don't always sit and, can, and assume that everyone's out to, get, out to get you, out to do something bad to you. Basically, think positive about your fellow Jew, work together, and build a just society. Right? He's saying, that's what the Nevim at the end of the first temple told the people. Now, in case you forgot what the Nevim Rishonim said, he's giving, he's giving a quick summary of the key message of the earlier prophets. By Manu Lakshi, the people of the first temple period didn't listen to the rebuke of Ishayel and 100 years later of Yirmiyahu, they put up a cold shoulder to the prophets and their ears they made hard on hearing. But his name is Mishmo. Um, I'll show you where this is coming from in a minute. No, it's, they made their ears, the people didn't listen. They heard the words of the rebuke of the prophet, but they didn't listen. They didn't internalize what they're saying. Okay? They put their hearts, they made their hearts like hard rock. God got super angry at his people because they didn't listen to the rebuke of the earlier Nevim. Now, um, I want to suggest where this phrase is coming from. Their ears, they made, were hard of hearing. Um, anyone know? I want to put people on the spot, but I'll share my screen. If you have a uh, um, talk with you, 
It's a famous Nebua, maybe not, should be a famous Nebua, of Isaiah. If you, open, if you have a top, you can open up Isaiah um, 59, Nuntet. And here we go. I'll share my screen real fast. If I open up the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, listen carefully. Two lines, okay? The Nevi says as follows. Hey, no katsra yad Hashem hoshia. God's hand is not too short to, um, to help you, to save you. Here's our phrase. And God's ears are not hard on hearing. We see this thing going to repeat itself later on in Sakhari as well. It means God is able to hear your prayers and God is able to help you. Why isn't God listening to your prayer? It's your sins, it's your bad behavior. It's dividing between you and God. And you're sinning. That's causing, God's, um, causing God to hide his face from you and not answer your prayer. And step panim is always when God doesn't answer prayer. Not God isn't watching, but God doesn't answer prayer because he's not deserving of his help. <laughs> and he gives the reason why. Because your hands are full of blood. Your fingers are full of iniquity. It's put there See, to take him the bruchaki, everyone speaking lies, not being truthful to one another. Your tongue is full of wickedness. Inquiry, but Sedek, no one calls out for justice. Ain't Nishpa Bemuna, Tokha Tova, the Ber Shabi goes on and on. Now, um, why is this important? Besides, it's an important message, but I think that's what Sky is referring to here. At the very end of this Nubuah, when God is really angry, remember, Vati, I met Naderet, there's no truth anywhere. Okay? And everyone, there's evil going on everywhere. And God's going to see, and he's going to, and he sees there's no justice. And therefore, God sees that no one is taking responsibility. Remember, like Moshe Rabbeinu, no one's taking responsibility. Okay? And therefore, he, he's going to put out, and he's going to um, do justice on his own. Now, what will happen? Uh, <coughs> ultimately, because we're God's people and our breed is whatever, Ultimately, God will bring redemption to Tzion. Right? Who will God finally bring redemption to? To those who do proper repentance. Right? Now, God will never be so angry that he'll cut, us, cut off his relationship with us forever. But ultimately, God will bring a redeemer to Tzion. Redemption will come to Tzion. For who? For those who repent from their sins. Fix their ways. Why? Because I have this covenant with you, God says. And my ruach will be with you forever, okay? And won't, it won't leave you, and it shouldn't leave your mouth and your arms and from your children from now and forever. I'm sure this looks very familiar. Right? Now you understand why we quote this in Davening? It's our last prayer. It's the final prayer after our prayer, remember? It's, it's, it's the end of Davening, was we do Shmoneser as our prayer, and we have a final extra prayer with, with, with uh, Shevach before, with Ashrei and Avod Again, we're making one last final prayer. We'll begin with this parak in, in um, quoting from Isaiah Nuntet. Ask almost anyone who says this every day. Almost no one knows where, this, where these people are coming from. But to appreciate why we say in davening, you have to understand the opening lines of the, of the parak of what's, why God knows. This pasuk is in context why God doesn't answer prayer. And if God doesn't answer prayer, it's not God's fault. It's your fault. And it's because of your behavior. No. <clears throat> why did I bring that down? I want to show you again why the Navi is saying there's enough prophecy before the second temple is finally rebuilt that I don't need new prophets. I simply have to study the existing prophets and I'll get a good idea of what God wants me. If I want to shape history, I'll have a good idea of what causes temples to be destroyed and what causes God to bless his people, what causes God to curse his people. Let's continue now to our source sheet and the rest now is going to be in English. Okay. Um, and with Hebrew English. Now, so this was, again, in chapter 7 in Scharia. God gives this answer. And now he explains why the first temple was destroyed. And hence, if you want the first temple, the second temple to work, don't repeat the same mistakes of the first temple. Now he explains what happened. Just like God called upon his people at the end of the first temple period, and they didn't obey, they didn't hearken his words. When they called out to me, when the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple, Amisrael called out to God, and God did not answer their prayers. Okay? And that's why. 
I called upon you to repent. You didn't repent. I sent the Babylonians to punish you. You were bad. I told you not to. And when you prayed to me, save us from the Babylonians, God did not answer your prayer because when I called on you to do tshuva, you didn't listen. And that's why I'm not answering your prayer. The same thing that we saw in Isaiah chapter 59. Okay. And therefore, what did God do? Vesareim. I'll call it Rahim. I scattered them on all the nations. I sent them to Babylonia and to Mesopotamia and some to Egypt. Nations they didn't know before out of the Tochacha. The land was desolate. Remember this phrase that's from the Tochacha, from people passing by. Right? A beautiful land became desolate. Got it? Now, just a review of the key events. Again, I'm not, I don't want to do the history of Bait Shani, just to show you this is the last day of Nevo and Tanakh. Again, we had the Cyrus decree. In the first Pasek in Ezra, there's an 18-year building freeze. They break ground on the second year of Dayavesh, and we complete construction in year six. And therefore, year four takes place in between these events. And we talked about, are they asking if it's going to work? Or are they asking, assuming it's going to work, do we continue fasting? Now, Sahariya continues. He doesn't end here, because ultimately he's going to give them an answer. Now he's going to explain what I call redemption is a two-way street. If you want the second temple to be successful, here's what you need to do. Okay. What's God saying? I'm zealous now for Zion. Okay. God wants to bring redemption. And what's he saying? God's saying, I'm returning to Zion. I'm going to dwell now in Yerushalayim. But on what condition? God's saying, here's what I can do. I can return on the condition that Yerushalayim becomes a city of truth. And hard svot Hashem harakodesh, meaning God can only do what He can do. God can make Yerushalayim a city of truth. We have to make Yerushalayim a city of truth by the way we behave there, and that will God, allow God Shekhinah to return to the city. He'll say this theme over and over again. Again, this idea of redemption being a two-way street. One of the most famous fukim in the old city. Baruch Hashem has been fulfilled in over the last hundred years already. Right? That there will be a time now that Jerusalem would be rebuilt and there'll be old people with little kids playing in the streets and old grandparents watching them on the benches, and which is a sign of normalcy and return to regular day-to-day life. The city of Jerusalem would be full, people shopping and, and talking and, and living their normal lives. And little children playing on the streets. And that's the biggest sign of redemption. God saying, those few who returned, who were like, can't believe this is happening, it's they can't imagine things could be so good. There'll be old people and young people and streets of Jerusalem will be alive again. He says it can happen. Okay. Don't think it's impossible, it's possible, but it's up to you. What's God saying? Okay. God's going to bring his people back from the east and from the west. We can figure out what side of the globe you're on. God will bring them and they'll dwell in New Shalim. And here, the famous line, the covenantal line through all of Chomesh and Avi. Remember the fourth cup? They'll be my people. I'll be their God. Okay. On what condition? If you do a met in Staka, he'll say that the Jewish people. When God gives them the opportunity to return and they reciprocate by building a society with truth and justice and righteousness, then the Shekhinah can return. Now, here's the word of God. Okay? He gives the people, he's giving them strength. Pay attention to the words you're hearing from the Nevim. He's quoting now Sagai. Remember what Haggai told you about how you misinterpreted the situation. And after, after 20 years after they returned, nothing got off the ground yet. And the people were saying, there's no point in rebuilding the temple because God doesn't want us back because the economy is bad. And or the political situation was bad. And construction was stopped. The people were understanding this difficult situation as a sign from God. He's not with them. He says, you have it all wrong. The reason why things are so bad is because you're not taking enough of the initiative to rebuild your society and rebuild your temple. He says, I mean, before, before that time, no one can make a living. He's just quoting Haggad, what he says, 
and things were a disaster. And now God says, Not like the first days when you were being punished when I wasn't with you. God will be with you, the people. It says the land will give its um, produce. The heavens will give its rain. And uh, you can dwell back on your land for those who are returning. Yeah. Now, that's what God can do. Now, here comes the what we need to do. Okay? Just like up until now, things were so bad that you were like the source of curse. People looked at you and said, look what happens to people who don't follow God. I'm going to redeem you, and you'll be a blessing in the eyes of the people. Don't be afraid. That says, be strong, and it can't happen. Now, here's what you need to do. Coming up. Just like God's saying, just like I plotted to bring you down when the first temple was destroyed, I plotted, I brought in the Babylonians because you didn't listen to me. It wasn't the Babylonians were the bad guys. I sent them. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar Abdi, Yirmiyahu says, Nebuchadnezzar was sent by God to punish them. Okay? When your ancestors right, made me angry, God says, and therefore I didn't change my mind. I allowed the korban, I allowed the destruction to happen. Now I'm going out of my way. I'm plotting again. I brought in the Persians. I'm doing everything I can do to be good to you, Shalim. Don't be afraid. But here's the key point. Everything the earlier Nevim said. Here's what you need to do. Words, the fact that God's promising there's redemption coming doesn't mean there will be redemption. It means there can be redemption. This can be redemption. doesn't mean there will be. Here's what you need to do. Dabru emet isha tereu. Speak truth, each man to his fellow man. Vemetu mishpat shalom shivtu b'sharechem. Again, do justice and have peace in your gates of your city. Vishet rat tereu atachshu b'avachem. The same idea. Don't plot against your fellow man and don't think evil about them. Don't swear falsely. Don't love doing that. Get that? These are things that God God hates, and that's again one of his highest main points. Now, what's he saying basically? He's not saying anything new. He's simply repeating what the first Nevim say. And I'm saying this is a springboard to tell people what he's saying is now that we're building the second temple, I don't need new Nevim. If you want to make sure the temple remains, just don't make the same mistakes of the first temple period. If you want to know why it was destroyed, again, open up Yeshaya, open up your Miel, and we'll see what they're quoting from very soon. Now, <clears throat> but remember, they asked the question about fasting. So finally he goes... The, he finally gives them an answer. By the Hashem's fault, I lie the more. God gives one more prophecy to Zechariah, the famous final one. Kol Hashem Tzvot, Tzoma Revi, V'Tzoma Chamishi, V'Tzoma Shvi, V'Tzoma Siri, the famous four fast days we talked about before. Remember, um, the one in Tammuz, the one in Av, the one in Tishrei, in the tent of Tebet. Okay? There, those fast days can turn into holidays and in days of rejoicing. On what condition? V'met V'Shal Mahavu. The truth and peace will be loved is not what God's promising. What God is saying is if when you return and you build your temple and you do truth and live in peace with one another and love doing that, then there's no reason for the temple to be destroyed. God will watch over you. And therefore, when you ask the question about what's considered a redemption process, like, like nowadays, is this what's called Rashid Sibichat Golotenu? Is this the beginning of a redemption process? It's not a question, is, is this the final redemption, yes or no? It means it can be a final redemption. When there's a redemption process happening, you can see Amisor returns to its land. If it is a redemption process, it's not up to God, it's up to us. If I study, if I follow this idea, we go from Nevoa to Chochmah, I don't need a Navi to tell us, is this the final redemption? I don't need a Navi to say, can you say Mishabach for the Medina and say Rishit Simichat Goloteno? When you say Rishit Simichat Goloteno, you you're not deciding for God this is the final redemption. You're understanding this could be a redemption, but it's up to us to make sure it happens. And that's a transformative understanding of what Gula means. Okay. Now God's saying not only <coughs> will the temple be rebuilt and things will be good again, saying you can even go a step farther and reach and achieve your biblical goal of why you were chosen. <laughs> the time will come. People, nations from far away will come. People from faraway lands, non-Jewish people, will come from faraway lands. They want to come and visit Israel. Non-Jews will be coming to search for God. Remember, the, the Vua began 
when the Jews in Babel came to ask God a question about fasting, says, you have it all wrong. You should be back in Jerusalem serving God, and other nations will come asking you questions. Things can be so good, not only that you'll have the temple, if you're acting properly and you return, things will be so good that other nations will look up to you, and you'll be this that other nations will appreciate. And <coughs> this is the sort of uh, redemptive idea, an ideal idea of um, redemption that Nabi is hoping for at the beginning of Ayat Shani. Why didn't it work? Because the people didn't do their side of it. Okay. The famous line at the end, the last line of the chapter, the last line of the prophecy, is that at that time when other nations will come, it will be so crowded in Yerushalayim, right? there will be people waiting in line, 10 people waiting in line for the audience of a Ishudi holding the bag and holding the garment of an Ishudi waiting for his guidance, saying, we want to follow you, we want to emulate you, we want to work with you, because we heard that God is with you. Meaning, and you know, that's the that's the highest ultimate hope that not only will Jews be coming back to ask questions about fasting, but rather Jews will come back and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild a country and be a nation that sanctifies God with a just society. And non-Jews will come for the audience of an Ishudi will guide them. You know this shir on Miguel Tester, this phrase Ishudi is two times in Tanakh. It's here and it's in um and Miguel Tester, where the Ishudi should be in Yerushalayim, he said he's in Shushan Abira, making, and his name is Marduk. Now, so I want to show you who are these Nevim that Sechari is quoting. Well, <coughs> we saw one example from Ishayel. I'll bring one example from Yermio. We'll go back to Ishayel again. Remember, his, his main thing is, what is it that you need to do to make sure there's not a Chorban? So if we look at Yermio chapter 7, that's a, that's a chapter where Yermiel predicts that the temple might be destroyed. Yermiel, remember, doesn't say, doesn't predict the temple will be destroyed. He said it might be destroyed. It's up to you. He predicts for sure the Babylonians are going to take over your country because you didn't follow God. But to the last minute, the Jews can, pre can prevent the temple from being destroyed if they listen to the Navi, accept Babylonian rule, and fix their society. And now here's earlier, right, before that decree came down, what Yirmiyahu was saying to prevent the destruction of the temple and, and prevent Jerusalem from being destroyed by the Babylonians. Again, Stand at the gate of the house of God. Give the following message to the people, to what people? This is the Nevo of Yirmiyahu to the people coming to the Beit HaMikdash the end of the second, end of the first temple period, before it's destroyed, this is about 15 years before it's destroyed, there are people coming to Yerushalayim and davening. This is the fourth year of Yehoiakim. Later, we'll see when the, in chapter 26, we have the date for this Nebuah. And people are coming and praying to God, save us from the Babylonians. So what's Yirmiyot tell, what's Hashem tell Yirmiyot to tell the people? So here's the word of God. Improve your behavior and your thoughts. Darchem is what you're doing. Darchem is what you plan on doing. Then you can remain and dwell in this city. Don't listen to the words of the false prophets who claim to be God's prophets. And they're saying the main thing God wants you to do is come and pray and say, how he's making fun of them. It was the, the false prophets, who again, who are God's prophets, misleading the people, thinking the only thing God wants is sacrifices and prayer. Says, no, that's not enough. Your, your prayer needs to be transformative that you don't pray to God, save us from the Babylonians. You pray to God, asking, asking him, why is God saying to Babylonians, what do we need to do for God to take the Babylonians away from us? He said, what's God say? If you do that, there won't be a destruction. That, that's exactly what Sakai is quoting, isn't it? That's my key point. Sakai is simply quoting the Navim Rishonim. Here's an example from Yermiel. Zechai doesn't need, we don't need the Nevoah, we simply have to read the existing ones and we can learn from them, we can use Chokhmah to apply it. So you don't pray to God to save us from enemies, you pray to God to remember how you need to behave so God won't send an enemy to punish you. So improve your ways, improve how you're acting, do Mishpat ben Isha ben Reyo, word for word that we saw in Zechariah. 
same thing. Gary, you're talking about Manal Tashoku, but Dam Nakiyat Tishpum Makomase. And again, don't follow other gods as well. Then Vishikanti is Kabam Makomase. Then you can remain. Just as a reminder, let's go back to we saw the same words in Sharia in the beginning of our source sheet. What does Sharia say? Um recall Marashem. Um, sorry, what do we have right over here? We had it. Yeah. Remember? He's quoting exactly Yermiel, and that's why Yermiel, the Sahai is quoting the new Rishonim have to be Yermiel. Okay? And then the Shekhinah can remain there. Um, what's the quote we have from Isaiah? Remember the famous chapter 2 in Isaiah, the verse about other nations coming? The famous nouveau of, of the famous vision of Yishev Ben Amos, the one that makes it to the Isaiah well, outside the UN. It was, the time will come when Amiso is doing well and God's house will be the top of all the mountains <coughs> and all the nations will flow to it. And the nations will come and visit. And here is the same word we had before. Many nations will come. You know the song very well, but basically, things will be so good, other nations will be coming to us. And that's exactly what we saw before in Sakharia, right? Uh, so I'm just showing you again that the Nevin Rishonim that Sakharia is talking about are simply things, examples from Isaiah and Yermiel, the Nevim who explained why God allowed the Assyrians, Isaiah and his colleagues, Amos, Hoshea, and Micha, explained why God allowed the Assyrians to come in and wipe out the 10 tribes and most of Yehuda. And later, according to Yemiel, what caused God to be angry and send the Babylonians to destroy the first temple? So those were the, the sources that we saw in um, from Sharia. Now, so I want to use this as a springboard to talk about this idea of Gula. And I want to share something from, from, um, where are we? Wait, there's stuff to share. I want to go to the, uh, I'll stop here for a second. Any questions so far? Questions? This is one. Already. No questions, we'll continue. Um, I want to talk about the word gu'ula, and how Chumash uses the word gu'ula, and why the last bracha of Shmon Esrei, I mean, the last bracha of Shema before Shmon Esrei, the top is, is gu'ula. We're all familiar with the Subracha before Shema Nesrei, before Shema. The two blessings before Shema introduce, well, the first blessing is, is explaining the existence of one God, Yotzer Morot. The second one is that God chose us to serve him. And that's the background for pledging allegiance when you say Shema, that Hashem, who's our God, who's our boss, he's everyone's God. And, and therefore, we're chosen to serve him. But that's the pledge of allegiance we say twice a day or three times a day. So those the blessings that precede Shema prepare you for the main message of the Shema. And then between Shema and Shema Nesra, we have the Bracha of Ga'al Yisrael. We're sort of thanking God for redeeming us in preparation for asking God for future redemption. Correct? Now, <coughs> I want to suggest that the Bracha of Ga'al Yisrael is not just saying thank you. I'll, I'll give an example what I mean by acting thank you. At the end of Sefer Vayikra, I'll share my screen from, I'll open up, I want to use a, um, where is a, where we use, oh, here's Vayikra, one second. Here. I want to use a uh, Tanakh that has Parshio. You'll see why. In Vayikra chapter 25, famous Parsha Bahar, that does Moshe Rabbeinu and Har Sinai saying, Tel B'nai Yisrael, um, when you come to land, the famous laws of, Shmi, of Shabbat Lashem, the seven-year Shemitah cycle, followed by the seven years um, Yovel cycle, which we're all, from, all familiar with. Now, notice at the, at the end of the Yovo year, everyone returns to their inheritance. Okay. Then he says right away, if you sell land to your fellow man or buy land, don't mistreat, don't cheat your fellow man. Meaning, if you know the laws of Yovo and where we are in the Yovo cycle, and the buyer or the seller is not aware of those laws, you can easily make it, take advantage of that and make extra money. Why? Because he doesn't realize that even though you're selling him the land, you're going to get it back in five years or 10 years. And therefore, you charge more than it's really worth. So it says, don't use your knowledge of Yovel to cheat your fellow men. And then give those laws. Now, 
And therefore, in, he summarizes again, Then listen, there's, then keep my chukim and my mishpatim, and God will bless the land. Now, after the laws of Shemitah and Yovel, watch what we have. Ki amuch achicha, means should your fellow man become poor and have to sell his land to somebody else. He can't make a living now, right? Be'ishkim kor beit Moshe, maybe he has to sell a home, right? Or ki amuch achicha, maybe he has to sell his land to a, uh, to, a, to, a for, to a foreigner, possibly, okay? In all those cases, what happens? Um, <coughs> in all those cases, who has to come and help him? What's it called? The person who comes and buys back the land for him, the person who gives him back his land, someone lost their land, the relative or neighbor or fellow Jew who comes and helps him from his distress, he's called a goel. Got that idea? And throughout this whole section, the same thing if you sell yourself into, if you're so poor, you have to sell yourself into slavery. Okay? And you sell and he has to sell himself into slavery, don't overwork him. Treat him well. Okay? And <clears throat> let's say a foreigner advise you and you sell yourself as a slave to a foreigner, then what? He needs gula as well. Okay? And it's relative, someone should be the goel, yigalenu, etc. And again, the person saving him is called the goel. And what's the if if bim lo yigael, if no one does save him? Then God will save him in the over year. And what's the final reason? Meaning, when we remember that God took us out of Egypt, we were enslaved. We were slaves. We had no land. We were in slavery. God redeemed, redeemed us from that slavery. In fact, he put us into that slavery to redeem us, to teach us this lesson. The way we say thank you for our redemption is not by just saying thank you, and thanking God, God, Yisrael, but by acting thank you. And therefore, when we make the bracha of Ga'al Yisrael, my point is, is that we're not just thanking God for Gula and saying thank you out, out of um, recognition, out of, out, of, um, out of thanks, but rather a transformative understanding of redemption that that's, I have to emulate God and that's how I, how I have to act. If God did that for me, I have to do that for others. Now, in light of that, what's the purpose of Shemitah? Right? The purpose of the land resting once every seven years is for the sake of the six years that you're that you don't keep shemitah. I'll explain what I mean. It's, man is naturally pro, is productive, right? By nature, society has productivity, and man needs to be productive, and that's the nature of man. And God wants you to be productive, but just like I stop all creativity one day a week, I work for six days. I'm creative, and I stop creativity one day out of seven, called Shabbat, to make sure that I use my creativity properly during the six days that I'm working. At the national level, we're productive for six years. And every seven years, we stop all productivity. Everyone's equal. No one makes more money than anyone else. To remember, so every even wealthy people know what it feels like not, not to be making money. And then that understanding of what it means to live day by day, um, that'll make the wealthy people, the landowners, and the stronger people more sensitive to help those who are less fortunate and be the goalim during the six years. Meaning the purpose of Shemitah is not to keep the Shemitah here. The purpose of Shemitah is to be educational that needs to affect how you act during the six years that it's not Shemitah. And therefore keeping Shemitah is not a mitzvah once every seven years. It's mitzvah every year of your life. The Shemitah year is setting an example, setting the stage. And for Shemitah to be, to be kept, <laughs> It needs to be implemented during the six years of Shemitah. Now, why am I bringing that down? Because we just saw Yermiel, Yermiel predicted Amisar going into exile. Remember, Amisar says we'll be in exile for 70 years. Where does Chumash predict this exile? In the next section, in chapter 26, the famous Tochacha, right? What's God say? If you follow my laws and keep my laws, and all the laws of Sefer Vayikra and all the laws of Parshat Mishpatim, who Ketavim Mishpatai started back in, right before Kedoshim to you. Is keeping God's laws are not just the laws of Shemitah, it's all the laws of Parshat Mishpatim, the laws of Sefer Dvarim, and the laws of, of Kedoshim to you. <coughs> it's all the laws about building this just society. Then God says, I'll reciprocate by giving you rain at the right time, the land will be blessed. And then, um, 
I want to go. I'll, I'll keep my covenant with you. I'll have. I'll keep my mishkan in your midst, okay? And be, I'll walk among you. We'll have this ideal covenantal relationship. Yeah. And that's why I took you out of Egypt to build that nation. If you don't listen to me, God says, and don't keep the things full, if you don't accept my laws and my regulations and don't keep build this just society, then not just Shemitah, but all the laws of Komish are building that society. Then I have to punish you little by little. Ultimately, I'll send you into exile. What do we say at the end? Um, we're going to go into exile. By Nishorim Bechem, people in exile, they'll be dwelling in their sin. Okay? And hopefully they'll do tshuva for the sins of their sins and sins of their answers. Bidvadu al avanam, they'll do tshuva. I'll make it a little bit bigger here. Bidvadu al avanam, they'll repent for their sins where they went against God. Okay? And therefore, even in the land of their exile, I'm hoping they'll finally give in and do proper tshuva. They'll break their uncircumcised heart. And then they'll feel sorry for their sins. And then God says, then I'll remember my greet with Yaakov and I'll bring, I'll bring them back. And now, in almost an ironic, almost a satirical way, God's saying, when they're in exile, because they didn't keep the Shemitah laws, the land will keep its Shemitah on its own when it's destroyed. What I want to say here, we don't go into exile because we don't keep Shemitah on the Shemitah year. We go into exile because we don't keep the theme of Shemitah during the six years when it's not Shemitah. And then this fits your meal perfectly. Being, the purpose of Shemitah is not the land needs to rest, some mystical idea that you have to make sure leave the land alone because it's holy once every seven years. You, your society needs to take a year off every seven years. And that experience of the seventh year has to affect how you act during the six years. And that's when you keep chukotai v'mishpatai. That's when you keep all God's laws of earlier in Sefer of Eikr, of Doshim Tiyu and of Parshat Mishpatim and of Sefer Dvarim, of building a society that will represent God and sanctify God in our day-to-day -day lives. And therefore, it's not that we go into exile because we don't keep Shemitah in the Shemitah year. We go into exile because we don't keep, we don't apply the Shemitah idea during the six years when it's not Shemitah. Because those are the Kukim Shemitim that we have to keep. Ironically, when we go into exile, the land will keep Shemitah without us because we're not there. But it's not that exile happens because of the loss of Shemitah. Exile happens because we don't apply the concept of Shemitah and we don't apply its message in the six years that we're working. And in that way, then the Nevot of Yirmiya and Yishayel fit perfectly with Pasha Bechu Um and therefore, even when we're in exile, okay, God doesn't leave us forever. Because I'm their God. They'll remember the Brit and ultimately bring us back again. And that's why he took us out of Egypt. And that's why hopefully he'll redeem us again. And then we summarize. These are the Chub Mishpatim and Torah. That's reviewed not just of Parsha Bahar, but of all the laws in Baikra. In fact, according to Eben Ezra and Smyrna, most and according to Chazal, um, is talking about the laws of Parsha Mishpatim as well. That we get at Har Sinai. And it's covenantal. Hashem Tan Hashem Beinu Bein Bnei Yisrael. Meaning these laws of Har Sinai, that God will be the that will be the reason for either blessing or curse. It's not just on the laws of Shemitah themselves, but all the laws of Kamesh. Shemitah is simply a law that's going to make sure that we keep them properly during the six years. Then it's not Shemitah. So that's the uh, that's why I want to share with you on the idea of Gula from Vayikra. Now. So to summarize, what I'm trying to show you is that basically what the Nevim did, the Nevim took their understanding of Pumash and applied it to their time period. And of course, God guided them and told them, God tells the Nevim, warn the people, if they don't fix their society properly, there's no point in Amisra being in this land if it's not sanctifying God in their day-to-day -day life. He'll warn them, he'll give them warning, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. If they don't get the message, ultimately God will have to bring a foreign enemy to throw us out in case we don't do proper tshuva. So what God is basically telling the Nevim is that what, what makes or breaks the future of the Jewish people, what breaks God either to bless us or curse us, is a function of our deeds at the society that we're building. That's the message that the Nevim say over and over again. The people don't internalize that message. Instead, they just turn to God. They think God's working for them. They pray to God, save us from the Babylonians, but they don't pray to change their behavior. And that's why God brings punishment. He says, God will bring you back. But when he brings you back, he wants to make sure you get the message right. So um, 
there's no need anymore then for classic Nevi'im, because what would Nevi'im say today? The same thing that earlier Nevi'im said, because they take the themes of Chomish and apply them. To apply the words of the Nevi'im in new situations, that's why I need Chochma. What's the Chacham do? The Chacham takes the Nevuot of the earlier Nevi'im, be Yishayel, Yirmiel, Shea, Mosh, Micha, and the themes of Chomish, and all the history of the first temple period, and he can take that and apply that to any new situation. How to apply it, you need to be chacham, you need to know Nevi'im, you need to know Torah Shabbat Peh, you need to know history, Jewish history, outside history, you need to understand your own time period, and how to apply that in any given generation, that requires chokhmah, not nevoah. We don't need God to predict events. God gives us a pattern. I need a chacham to guide us how we have to be paved to be deserving of God's help. And that's my idea of why we go from chokhmah, from nevoah to chokhmah, not that it was over, the job of the Chacham is simply to apply the things of Nebua to new situations. And that's why Miyom Shachar Beit HaMikdash, basically, as soon as the second temple is built, there's no longer Nevi'im getting a message from God to tell the people what to do. Because the last message God tells Charya is, you don't need any more Nevi'im, just open up the, what, what he called Nevi'im Rishonim. Hope that's clear, got my point? Is that the, the final dated Nebua of Tanakh is where God's telling the Navi. Tell the people they don't need any more Nevi'im. Just open up what the earlier Nevi'im said and learn from that, and then you'll know what God wants you to do. If you want to fast on the fast days, that's fine. But your fast, remember not what happened, but why it happened, but what needs to be. And if you really internalize the message and do it right, the fast days can become holidays because there's no reason to remember. Okay, Nadi has a question. What's the difference between Torah message and Nevi'im? No, uh, basically, um, the Torah is the key message of Chumash, how we have to behave. The Navi applies it during situations in the time of the Shoftim, in the time of um, First Temple period, it, it applied it. And then between the themes of Chumash and their application in the First Temple period, I combine them together, I think apply them to a future time period. In other words, I need, I need Chumash and Navi to know how to apply them. Uh, there's one other chat. One other chat was, um, oh, line breaking occasionally. I'm sorry about that. Um, any other questions? We're good. My time's just about up. Okay, so everyone have a uh, a good day. Wait, one other question. How do we know who's the Chacham? Ah, <laughs> that's a good question. Who's the Chacham? Um, a Chacham is someone who, what do you call it? Who applies, who, you know, it's, if you study Nevim and see what people are saying, if it fits with the themes of, of Nevim, then you're in, uh, then I guess you can call him a Chacham. No, maybe they're not Chacham. Someone uses Chokhmah. Again, that's the question, you know, which prophets you listen to. Uh, God holds the people responsible for listening to the false prophets in the time of Yirmiel. The false prophets were saying, Yirmiel is saying, God wants you to repent and improve your behavior. The false prophets are saying, God just wants you to daven all day long. And they're being punished for listening. Nevim have to say what people need to hear, not what they want to hear. There's a tendency of, of leaders to say what people want to hear, not what they need to hear. And, uh, and God punishes people for listening to, to leaders who tell them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear, because they should know how to ask and what to ask for. Because they're also, God gave them much to learn. And one other chat here was, okay, who's a chacham, and thank you. Okay. So everyone have a wonderful day, and a chodesh tov, and a good summer. And hopefully, um, um, maybe somebody's listening to the, that was, how to apply that today, I don't think it's very hard to figure out. But you know, what type of behavior God's happy with nowadays and what people would be disgusted with, just listen to the news and you have a pretty good idea. But if we're not acting kind and just and, and not thinking bad about one another and doing mishpat and staka and, you know, and serving God properly, I think, uh, I think it's not too hard to figure out what God would want nowadays. Okay. Okay, so everyone have a good day and I'll shoot off the uh, recording.